For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. Today we're joined by Charles Shu of the Chiao Collective. The Chiao Collective is a group which has been working extensively on matters of both US-China relationships, the various ups and downs that have been taking place in these relationships, as well as China's own internal trajectory in terms of economic growth, its policies, and its approach to various countries outside. Thank you so much, Charles, for talking to us. Thank you for having me on. So today I thought we could talk a bit about uh, a number of aspects, but maybe st to start with what's, called, what's being called the tech war, which is a bit of sometimes a misleading term because there's no war with two sides taking place. It's really an extensive and extended session of bullying by the United States. But what do we, we do see is that over the past couple of years, definitely it has intensified with Huawei recently, but it's been going on for a while. There was ZT before. There, were a number, there was a lot of US pressure on various countries to avoid mm -hmm. using Huawei, Huawei's technology even before. There was the arrest of the uh, senior Huawei executive as well. And in the past one year, we've seen uh, increasing amount of action by the US. So to begin with, uh, could you just talk about what you see as what the aims of the United States are as far as this uh, tech assault is concerned? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that what is referred to as uh, the tech war on China or, uh, you know, from, from a more sort of Western-oriented perspective, uh, a tech war between the U.S. and China with the sort of implicit assumption there that we're talking about a rivalry between equals in some rough sense, right. um, really needs to be understood in uh, a sort of somewhat longer-term historical context. Mm -hmm that begins with uh, you know, the, the reform and opening process within China itself, uh, China's sort of uh, controlled uh, reintegration into uh, you know, the global uh, capitalist infrastructure at a moment when you know, the, uh, the entire global system was uh, uh, transitioning uh, quite dramatically into its current neoliberal form. Right. And uh, it needs to be understood sort of from, from the perspectives uh, and from the strategic imperatives of both the United States and China. The expectation of the United States was essentially that, you know, here we are being given almost on a platter thanks to, you know, the Sino-Soviet split, um, thanks to, you know, the sort of newfound openness of, uh, the, you know, the Communist Party leadership to control forms of foreign direct investment um, and diplomatic rapprochement. Uh, we're being given on a platter almost uh, all of these essentially sort of free gifts of, of China's developmental model uh, in the earlier decades of the People's Republic, right? Um, a highly sort of educated workforce, extensive infrastructure, um, and you know, of course, the size of the potential market, both for labor and uh, you know, as 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 time went on, and 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 China and China's uh, income, uh, you know, itself grew uh, a consumer market as well for Western goods, and you know, the sort of idea from from the U.S. perspective was okay, we're going to strike this grand bargain, right, um, where uh, China would open itself up to uh, U.S. and more generally Western uh, foreign investment. Um, granted, you know, uh, in, in some ways on, 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 on China's terms and uh, by dint of its uh, inclusion into, um, into global capitalism, into, you know, these sort of extended uh, global value chains that, that, you know, were becoming more and more integral to, to world capitalism, uh, that these would create the conditions essentially for, for China to take its place among the ranks of other uh, sort of, you know, uh, peripheral or semi-peripheral nations that, that, you know, had a well-defined place uh, as, as manufacturing hubs, right? Uh, as, as sites where, uh, you know, cheap labor um, could, could be found and, and, and where, uh, you know, U.S.-based multinational corporations uh, would have a reliable, uh, you know, source of, of hyper-exploitable 
uh, labor and resources, right? And the expectation was that was that essentially, you know, you would have the rise of a comprador bourgeois class in China, which would uh, then, you know, have the capacity to essentially capture the state, right? Whether under the, you know, aegis of, of continued Communist Party rule or not, um, the idea was that was that the Chinese state would then become pliable, you know, itself to to the demands of of uh, U.S. capitalism, right? Um, that it would willingly take this sort of semi-peripheral place, um, and 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 that it would essentially offer up in, uh, in large measure its own sort of sovereignty, its own prerogative to determine the course of Chinese development um, in a way that was amenable to U.S. interests, right? From the Chinese side, uh, you know, you had a, a, a very much a longer term developmental plan put in place that offered for several decades an apparent convergence of interests with uh, what the U.S. was pursuing. Namely, you know, uh, to, to sort of strategically open up to foreign direct investment uh, on the conditions that you know, foreign multinational investors uh, would abide by Chinese law; that they would um, accede to uh, the requirements of technology transfer to Chinese firms; that they would allow the creation of Communist Party cells within their own uh, 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 branches in China, right? Um, <clears throat> and 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 in general, that that this opening would be a controlled process uh, that would serve. Uh, the interests of, of China's own uh, developmental project, which was essentially to, you know, uh, incorporate uh, sort of all of these advantages of, uh, you know, and, 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 and fruits of, of uh, foreign capitalist investment uh, for its own sovereign ends. And, you know, they recognized as well that, that with the shifting configuration of, of global capitalism, um, it would require in some me you know in, in some ways uh playing by the rules of the global system established by the united states right for its own advantage uh up to a point um simply in order to to acquire uh, uh the technology then you know needed to to sort of bootstrap china's own uh domestic um <clears throat> you know technological base uh, in order to to build its productive forces, and uh, you know, in order to to arrive at a position of strength, of relative strength compared to what, where it was previously in the global pecking order, uh, wherein it could actually uh, assert, you know, uh, the kind of sovereignty that would that would then be needed in order to pursue uh, an independent developmental path. And what we're seeing now is essentially. Uh, the results of that uh, sort of very pragmatic and, as it turns out, transient bargain um, breaking apart because of the inherent contradiction between those two expectations. Because contrary to what the United States at least hoped for, um, we have not had, uh, you know, the, the, the establishment of, of a comparable bourgeois class in China that you know essentially is is aligned in its material and its political interests with U.S. imperialism and has effective control of the Chinese state and party apparatus. And it, and it must be mentioned as well that you know the 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 longer term sort of ideal situation for the United States has always been outright regime change in China. You know, um, you know for 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 a while, I uh, you know at least. For the sake of appearances, uh, you know, it accepted the sort of political leadership of the Communist Party, you know, while its its policy making appeared to be compatible with with U.S. economic interests, but it was never entirely comfortable with that situation. But now we are seeing essentially, uh, uh, you know, China's longer term plan paying off, um, and, and and in particular. Uh, you know, a renewed orientation, particularly through, uh, you know, the Made in China 2025 initiative, um, through, you know, the rise of, of Huawei, as you mentioned, uh, to the status of, you know, um, 
a multinational corporation of, of, of global extent, right? Uh, the world's number one producer of telecoms infrastructure. And as of last month, I believe, uh, also the number one smartphone supplier. Um, uh, and certainly the global leader in, in development of, of 5G infrastructure, right? Uh, far outstripping any US-based competitors, uh, which, which, you know, in, in terms of these sort of critical technologies as, as the US describes them, uh, you know, is, is, is genuinely uh, posing um, a threat at least to the US monopoly on the sort of higher value end of the value chain. Because, uh, you know, the, 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 the way that global imperialism operates uh, today for the most part is, 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 is through this international division of labor where, you know, countries of the global south, uh, China included, are, you know, uh, assigned essentially the role of, of manufacturing hubs, right? Uh, where sort of uh, the lowest value added uh, elements of the production process are, are you know, sort of localized. Um, while, you know, Western countries like, like the United States in particular uh, continue to monopolize sort of the higher value added elements of that whether at the start of the process with R and D or at the end with marketing and sales. And, 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 and therein lies, you know, precisely uh, the, the linchpin of the U S advantage uh, and, 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 and the position that it wants to maintain. Um, so, you know, you see there uh, a direct uh, conflict between, you know, U.S. expectations and reality that is now leading uh, to to you know this this apparent tech war that that at least in terms of what you see in Western media gives off the appearance of actual parity where it's still not there. Absolutely, yeah. And in this context, uh, the important thing also would be to figure out, say, especially what has changed maybe over the past two to three, mm -hmm. two to three, four years, which has really intensified this. Is it purely Trump sort of looking to create a, say, some kind of, you know, appeal to his base in some way, playing on what has been his slogans for a long time? Or is there something even more structural that's happened? Yeah, it's, it's certainly a combination of, of factors. Um, I think, I think, you know, in terms of, in terms of the rhetoric, certainly in terms of uh, the overt pursuit of, you know, this, this trade war with China, um, you know, it dovetails very well with, uh, this nativist and, and indeed at times pseudo workerist, um, you know, agenda that, right. that, you know, Trump was elected on that he, uh, has pursued rhetorically throughout his time in office. And, um, yeah, which, 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 which essentially, uh, has, you know, made even more hegemonic this narrative, uh, that is, that is shared at a bipartisan level in the United States, exactly. uh, that, you know, this very intentional strategy by us multinational corporations, right. From the very start of the neoliberal era of, you know, offshoring their sort of, um, you know, lower value added, uh, more labor intensive, less capital intensive components of the manufacturing process right. to uh, countries like China, right, uh, was, you know, from the beginning, an insidious uh, state driven plan by China to to steal jobs, right. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, sort of getting completely backwards, uh, the the actual chain of causation that, that exactly. led to sort of mass deindustrialization in the United States right. and the creation of this, uh, you know, sort of very downwardly mobile, um, you know, commonly white, either, either proletarian or, or, or lower middle class uh, uh, fraction that constitutes Trump's base. At the same time though, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's coming as well from, from the recognition that uh, China, you know, China's very intentional strategy of moving up the global value chain 
uh, it means in concrete terms that uh, China is acting, you know, with with the explicit intention of appropriating more and more of the surplus that is generated by its own workers' labor, right? The the, the material process of manufacturing, um, you know, it 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 entails sort of hyper exploitation of uh, Chinese labor, wherein uh, China up to now, as the world's quote unquote factory, has been appropriating a pretty small sliver, right? right. And where you know the more its position uh, is 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 entrenched there, uh, you know the more the more that that the gap in fact widens, at least in absolute terms, uh, between between you know the income that appropriates the United States versus what appropriates uh, uh, what what you know sort of is is returned to China essentially, um, and therefore in quantitative terms it actually uh, you know. The, the, the situation that still obtains now for the most part is that, you know, it, it actually deepens the disparity between, between the U.S. and China in absolute terms in terms of per capita income. When, when, when this, you know, rivalry is presented as, as a, a contest between equals, right, uh, it completely occludes the fact that, you know, if you look at a per capita basis, uh, Chinese GDP is comparable more to, to the level of, of Brazil or Mexico than, you know, indeed, even, even the worst off uh, states in the first world, right? And uh, that's, that's, you know, the, the, the sort of very deep structural reason why China has been pursuing this strategy of moving up the value chain um, with, with Huawei in many ways leading the way uh, at least on the telecommunications side of things, and uh, just just in terms of uh, you know how big you know the the U.S. slice of the pie is compared to China's, uh, that that represents uh, you know in, in many ways like like uh, indeed a growing threat to to the sort of monopolistic position that U.S. capital uh, maintains in these sectors.